Hello and welcome everyone to our Clean Air Day webinar on air quality and health. It's great to see so many of you here. Uh, my name is Christabel Watts and I work at the Environment Centre, also known as Tech, based in Southampton, and I'll be chairing today's session. Uh, we're also joined by some of our air quality expert speakers, uh, Professor Sir Stephen Holgate and Hazel Agomba, and a little bit later, hot off another webinar, Dr Malcolm White will be joining us. Um, I'll tell you a bit about more about each of them before their presentations. So the timings are with welcome and introductions. Um, Professor Holgate will speak about air pollution and health. Hazel will speak about sources of indoor and outdoor air pollution. And Dr. White will speak about talking to patients about air pollution. And then we'll have time for a Q and A and aiming to finish at two. As you may have heard when you join the session, it's being recorded and will be shared afterwards for those who couldn't make it or want to rewatch it. Um, please use the Q&A for any questions for the speakers and presentations. I'll keep an eye on them throughout the session and raise them in the Q&A session at the end. And please use the chat to share if you want who you are, where you're from or where you work and what brings you to the webinar today. So if anyone has any questions or any trouble hearing me, um, but if not, I'm going to to get started. Um, our first speaker is Professor Holgate, who is the UK Research and Innovation Clean Air Champion, uh, Special Advisor to the Royal College of Physicians on Air Quality, and a Medical Research Council Clinical Professor of Immunopharmacology at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Southampton. He will be speaking about the link between air pollution and health, diseases affected by air pollution, including the effects on children and maternal exposure, and current air pollution targets and levels. So hopefully, Stephen, you can share your screen and begin when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to put my screen up. Uh, I think that's all right. We'll get started. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me, uh, Christabel, to join this uh, webinar today. Uh, Clean Air Day, of course, uh, and I think for most of people in the United Kingdom, they're having quite a lot of sunshine, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to have an air pollution episode today, so uh, it's probably quite timely we're having this discussion. Um, so as you heard, my interest really is, our, is on the health effects of air pollution and to see whether we can really start beginning to get our air quality improved, both outdoors and indoors, and we're going to hear from our second speaker a little more about all of that but I'm going to concentrate on the health aspects and we all of course are very clear now that there are multiple chemicals that get released into the atmosphere that are affecting human health. Um, a lot of these are emitted from anthropogenic or human activity of which combustion is probably the most important and relevant one. And it's not just combustion related to the internal combustion engine and vehicles, but it's combustion of any form, whether it's related to forest fires or burning wood in our homes, or whether it's combustion related to industrial processes. The pollutants that we're really concerned about now, more than anything, are the small particles, and they're shown on this slide uh, to give you an idea of their size relative to a human hair or fine beach sand. And you can see, looking at the blue circles, that the PM10, that is the uh, particles that are 10 micrometers or less in, in mass median diameter, um, really are much smaller than a human hair. But the ones that we're particularly concerned about now go even smaller than that, the so-called PM2.5, and they're shown as the red circles. And believe it or not, there are particles even smaller than that, uh, so-called ultrafine or nanoparticles, and they're shown in the bottom right-hand side of this picture, uh, very small particles at 0.1 micrometer uh, in mass median diameter. These particles, of course, are not pure chemicals in their own right. They're a mixture of chemicals. They often contain a carbon core, as you can see in the top right-hand corner of this slide, and then adhering to this core are a variety of chemical substances, metals, various uh, organic chemicals from the combustion process, as well as some biologics, uh, such as pollen fragments 
bacteria and viruses, which all adhere to the surface of these uh, particles. So they really are, are a bit like a Trojan horse that they are able to carry chemicals uh, into the human body when they're inhaled. Now the sources, which we'll be hearing more about in a few minutes, uh, are variable. Obviously road transport of one form or another, whether it's us using our cars or motorcycles, or whether it's the transport of materials around the country uh, is a major uh, contributor. But don't forget we have ships and trains, which also contribute, as well as a whole variety of other uh, sources of materials that contribute to the air pollution and indeed contribute to the constituents of the so-called PM 2.5. And the secondary generation of these particles by chemical interactions in the atmosphere, particularly during times like now when we have all this hot sunshine, uh, is an important uh, source of this particular uh, group of air pollutants. And we know now, as you can see in the bottom of this slide, that these small particles, the PM10, 2.5 and 0.1, are linked to millions of global premature deaths. In fact, latest figures are about 7 million deaths each year uh, across the world. So we're talking about the most important environmental health effect that's influencing uh, humans uh, existent on this earth at the present time. What about the levels of pollutants? Well, of course, there has been a huge amount of research about this that started with the six city studies some nearly 30 years ago now, 25 years ago, but they've expanded into epidemiologic studies involving many millions of people. This is just one of them in the United States, looking at 60 million Medicare beneficiaries, which by definition are gonna be older people. And you can see on the vertical axis for both the small particles on the left and ozone on the right, the hazard ratio for uh, death uh, on the vertical axis and the level of pollutant along the horizontal axis measured in micrograms per meter cubed or parts per billion in the case of ozone. You can see that the line passes through one for both of these pollutants. Now one is on a log scale, so that basically means it's naught on a non-log scale in that there are no safe levels of air pollution. There are no thresholds that air pollution is bad all the way down to zero. And this has really been quite an eye opener and it's led as you will see a little bit later on to why the WHO have changed their guideline limit values. But the important thing about those that are exposed to these pollutants is that the diseases we are witnessing and they're often often the non-communicable diseases like heart and lung and endocrine and central nervous system diseases are occurring at levels far below the current national standards. Furthermore, those that are least able to cope with them, those living in uh, inequalities and disenfranchised societies are those that reap the worst effects of these pollutants. So what about the effects? What are they? Well, we now know that they cause, of course, lung disease and probably most importantly, cardiovascular disease. And you can see in the red box there, the large number of cardiovascular uh, abnormalities that breathing these small particles can generate. But once they reach the lung, they pass through the lung into the circulation and they can end up in any organ of the body. And here they work by accelerating the aging of cells and organs. And therefore we've got their effects on almost every human NCD, ranging from coronary heart disease, hypertension, metabolic disease, COPD, diabetes, dementia, et cetera, et cetera. Furthermore, as shown in the bottom right here, we know that these pollutants that are breathed in by pregnant women can cross the placenta and reach the fe fetus and influence the way the organs develop in the developing fetus. And of course, here we're looking at gene bioenvironmental interactions where the pollutants, either through the placenta or through molecules that the placenta releases, influences through altering the way the genes are expressed in the developing fetus, the development of particular organs. So beyond the uh, enormous uh, number of diseases influenced by air pollution. There's also this inequalities issue. This is a big study in London, looking here at communities in different parts of London by IMD decile, which is a measure of inequalities. 
And you can see if we're looking at air pollution here, on the left for NO2, one of the gaseous pollutants, on the right, PM2.5, that those most exposed to the pollutants are those on the, uh, the least deprived parts of our community. And this is just one city in London. It's gonna happen in all of our cities and indeed has been shown across the world. So again, it just emphasizes that those least able to cope are those most exposed. And the final point about the medical side of all of this is that yes, we are exposed from the beginning of life, from conception till the time we die. But just like tobacco smoking or eating carbohydrates in excess, these effects are cumulative over time. In other words, they're affecting people across the entire life course having different disease manifestations at different ages. And that some of the diseases are listed, as you can see in this slide, that is produced by Public Health England. But it's children in particular, of course, that we're really concerned about because they are our future generation. And of course, children are exposed, as I mentioned, uh, in the uterus, but also once they're born, they are increasingly exposed to pollutants in the outdoor air because they're obviously closer to the source of the pollutants, to fresh pollutants being emitted by vehicles, as you can see in the top right-hand side, and in a thermograph picture, the bottom right-hand side of this slide. And you can see that children are in fact, the ones who are particularly falling into this susceptibility group. And the reason why it's important in children is that they are still growing, they're still developing, not only in the uterus, which of course is where the organs are forming, but also once they reach uh, the outside world. And this diagram on the right hand side shows how air pollution can influence the grow growth of, in this case, the lung, and it can interfere, interfere with the development of the most peripheral bronchial tubes, the tubes right down here uh, in the lower part of the lung, uh, around about the 20th to the 23rd generation, which continue to develop uh, until a child reaches about 13 years of age. But you can also see on the left-hand side, multiple other effects of air pollution on children, which I won't go through because you can read what's in the boxes. Uh, and of course the respiratory aspects and diseases like asthma and allergy are particularly prominent here. But also the seeds for cardiovascular disease are being sown during this early uh, exposure of children to air pollutants. But let me just go back now to the uterus and to the role of a placenta. And there's a model of a placenta in the top left-hand corner of this slide, where the maternal circulation interfaces with the fetal circulation and exchange occurs across the large surface area where nutrients and oxygen uh, and ga other gases are transferred. And you can see on the right-hand side here that at the placental fetus interface that there are a variety of different effects of pollutants, which in the end lead to this thing called oxidant stress, where the baby during development is subjected to this premature aging process, which leads to the organs not developing properly. And therefore we have a lower birth weight, we have uh, sensitization of the immune system such that diseases like asthma and allergy become more common once the child's born. We have smaller lungs in children born in polluted areas, and we have an increase in miscarriage and smaller for dates babies. And all of this really is a complex interaction between the air pollutant and the child, probably mediated through this oxidant stress and these so-called epigenetic changes in the developing baby where the environmental pollutants directly or indirectly are programming the expression of genes. And so it's these accumulated data, the epidemiology, all of the medical science that's come forward in the last decade that has led the WHO to revise their guideline values. And here you can see the 2005 guideline values and the new September the 21st, September 2021 guideline values for PM2.5, PM10 and NO2. And you can see that for uh, PM2.5, the guideline value has dropped from 10 to five micrograms per meter cubed. And for nitrogen dioxide, which is the dominant pollutant from diesel vehicles from 40 to 10. 
And our current air quality limit values set by the European Union and adapt, adopted by the UK government uh, post-Brexit are shown in red. And you can see, compared to the new air quality guideline values, which are health related by the WHO, these are far in excess of those that are influencing uh, human health. Now, I've become very uh, sensitized to the importance of all of this, having uh, provided evidence to this important case uh, of Ella Kissy Debra, who had her inquest overturned in December 2020 as a result of the evidence that we were able to gather to show that her very severe asthma that began uh, two and a half years before she died was responsible, that air pollution was responsible in large part for a lot of her very chronic severe disease, leading to in excess of 25 hospital admissions of which respiratory and uh, cardiovascular collapse was a very frequent manifestation. And it was really the evidence base from all of this and the fact that Ella lived only 80 feet from the uh, London South Circular Road, one of the busiest roads in London, and the level of, of the evidence we were able to accumulate to demonstrate that her asthma, in this case, was linked to air pollution, was deserving of a re-examination of her case, which was done, as I mentioned, in December 2020, the details of which are shown here. And on the right hand side, you can see that up to the age of about five and five and a half, uh, or sorry, seven or seven and a half, Ella was a, a really um, um, active child who uh, not only was uh, playing sport and doing music and reading and doing well at school, but she was just a fully normal child. But all of that changed two and a half years before she died. And this just shows a graph. I'm sorry, it's a bit complicated, but the wiggly lines are the various air pollutants, the grey one being uh, NO2 and the red and pale blue one in the middle being PM2.5 and PM10. And you can see that across just here three or four months um, in 2011, the very large variations in these air pollutants. And each of those vertical red lines that you can see are when she had an emergency admission to hospital. And that this occurred with severe asthma, often with respiratory arrest, largely in the late autumn, winter and early spring months, as you can see uh, very obviously in that slide. And when she passed into the summer months, as we can see here, that the uh, air pollution level dropped, as you can see by the grey and the pale blue and other lines there, uh, and her asthma attacks uh, stopped occurring in such dramatic event. And even when we put allergy on top of this, and this is the pollen count in the area close to where Ella lived, we could not account for her very nasty, severe asthma episodes, either through allergen exposure and pollen counts to which she was sensitive to, uh, nor to virus and bacterial infections. And I haven't got time to go into the details of that. But it was air pollution that looked the most likely problem. And this led the assistant coroner to come up with the uh, Prevention of Future Death report that made these three important points, which I won't read out, but basically saying that the community out there did not have enough information about air pollution and human health, nor did the health professionals, and that we were breathing air that was still toxic, hence his recommendation that we need to move much more rapidly towards the WHO health-related guideline values. So this is the latest data that uh, uh, the um, DEFRA and the government are working towards, that they want to get uh, the uh, annual PM2.5 limit value down to 10 micrograms per meter uh, by 2040, that is from 20 to 10, uh, and then to uh, reduce the population exposure by 2018. And you can see some statistics here. If we were managed to achieve that uh, on the right bottom uh, frame, you can see the huge effect it would have on human uh, diseases such as asthma and coronary heart disease. And the maps can show you uh, that the air quality would fall into line across most of our urban conurbations in the UK if we achieved this. But this is by 2040, which is a long time away. So we feel now that I think we can do better than this, that by linking the uh, air quality improvement to the 
climate change, zero carbon agenda, we can gain the, the human health benefits of reducing air pollution at the same time as improving the important uh, indices of climate change. And that's what this uh, horizontal, this uh, diagonal line is meant to indicate, that can we get the co-benefits where the government at the present time is working towards uh, climate change uh, net zero, can we get the benefits of, of air quality improvement? And the answer is yes. And this study undertaken by Imperial College, funded by the Clean Air Fund, shows that it, we could achieve the, the, the 10 microgram per meter cube level from 20 for PM 2.5 by 2030. And this would lead to these incredibly impressive statistics, both economically and on human health. So there's no real excuse why we can't make a few additional adjustments and they're listed here, reducing the emissions from cooking somewhat, wood burning somewhat, construction machinery somewhat, domestic and commercial heating, etc. A small amount of all of these, plus the net zero agenda the government's currently supporting would give us the 2030 PM 2.5 uh, 10 microgram per meter interim target very satisfactorily. And this is what it would look like. On the left hand side, you've got the various air quality limits at the present time. And you can see that the current UK air quality limit for the annual average 2.5 uh, PM 10 2.5 is 20. But if we actually got to 10, what the country would look like. And it would be very dramatic changes in terms of cleaning up the air, as well as the enormous uh, changes uh, on the benefit for human health. And all of our major cities, Glasgow, Birmingham, London, would now come under the WHO interim guideline value of 10 micrograms per meter cubed. And it shows on the right hand side, it's all possible with the changes currently in place with a little bit of extra. So I'll end by saying that, look, people will change their behavior if they see this behavior as being easy, rewarding, empowering, and normal. And I think as health professionals and other people working in this area, it is our responsibility to really show that this is achievable. And what better day to say that than on Clean Air Day 2022? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you for all that detail on the health impacts of air pollution and that call to action at the end that I think is something that we can all take away from this webinar. Um, I've, I've noticed a question popping up and just to remind everyone, if you have any questions for presenters um, or based on the content of the presentations, please do put that in the Q&A um, box and we will um, address that at the end in the Q&A section. And now we're going to move over to Hazel. Um, and Hazel Gombar is that senior engagement officer here at the Environment Center um, charity. And she's a member of Mums for Lungs. Uh, she will be speaking about sources of indoor and outdoor air pollution and how to avoid them, as well as some of the advice and support services we offer as a charity to local residents. Good afternoon everybody, it's really good to be here on Clean Air Day and um, air is arguably our most pressured shared resource, of course it's vital to life and getting some fresh air is well known for being beneficial to our health and yet at the same time the very air that we breathe can be polluted and can be a source of ill health as Professor Holgate has clearly explained. In this short presentation, I'll be covering the main sources of air pollution and examining what we can do to reduce our exposure to it and what we can do to help our patients, clients, friends and family and the public in general to reduce their exposure to. So there are three main types of air pollution. There are gases such as nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide and ozone and perhaps the most well-known and immediately dangerous air pollutant, carbon monoxide, which can kill within a few hours. Um, particulate matter, as Professor Holgate has referred to, are tiny specks of dirt, dust and liquid droplets, which come in various shapes and sizes. The smaller they are, the more damaging to health, since they are so easily inhaled. And a report by the Institute of Health Metrics states that particulate air pollution poses a greater health risk for the world as a whole, 
than alcohol, physical inactivity or high salt diets. Then there are chemicals such as volatile organic compounds or VOX as they're known, which are also a significant form of air pollution and examples include formaldehyde, acetone and benzene. And the low level effects of VOX include throat and eye irritation and headaches and dizziness, while long-term exposure to VOX can lead to an increased risk of cancer. And finally, we have mold. Mold growth contains harmful biological contaminants that are bad for health when inhaled, and mold is especially harmful to respiratory health. So the face of air pollution has changed. These days, many air pollutants are invisible. Car fumes, for example, are usually invisible unless it's a very cold day when you can see smoke coming from the exhaust pipe. Modern engine combustion means that particulate matter is much smaller and the thick black industrial smoke from the past. And because it is smaller, it's more harmful when inhaled because it passes through our body's defense mechanisms like nose hair, for example, and can lodge deep within our bodies. And because it's largely invisible, air pollution can be a difficult topic to engage people with. And despite the harm that it causes, it's often forgotten or ignored. And scientists describe air pollution as the invisible killer. So what are the main sources of air pollution? They tend to be classified as outdoor or indoor air pollution. So outdoor, one of the main sources is of course road transport. The exhaust fumes from cars, lorries and vans, but also tyres are a significant source of air pollution as tiny particulates are shed by tyres as they wear on the road. And a recent study has revealed that almost 2,000 times more particulate pollution is produced by tyre wear than is pumped out of the exhaust of modern cars. And this is because the size and weight of modern cars has increased quite dramatically. Another major source is household burning, so smoke from log burners, open fires and bonfires, etc. And then energy generation and industry, farming and other transport sources such as aviation and shipping, the main sources of outdoor air pollution. The average person spends 90% of their time indoors, and in fact indoor air pollution can be more harmful than outdoor. Household and office and school indoor air pollution isn't always easy to spot and its effects on health are widely underestimated. It's linked to a litany of health issues and is also linked to absenteeism and reduced cognitive performance. Many daily activities produce air pollution, cooking, smoking and burning solid fuels such as wood, coal and charcoal. Log burners and open fires not only cause outdoor air pollution but also indoor. A log burner releases lots of particulates into a room when the door is open for refuelling. Domestic appliances such as boilers can emit carbon monoxide and gas ovens and hobs produce nitrogen dioxide. New furniture and furnishings emit volatile organic compounds, particularly when they're new, and building materials such as fittings and floorings can also emit box, as do household and personal care products such as paints and varnishes, air fresheners, deodorants and perfumes, aerosols, cleaning products, candles, the nail varnish. And then there are biological sources. I've already referred to mold, but there's also dust mites, pet hair and pollen. And then there are naturally occurring pollutants such as radon, which is a radioactive gas that seeps from the rocks and soils and granite areas. A radon is found everywhere to some degree and levels vary throughout the country. I've mentioned the pollution from burning solid fuels a couple of times so far. And here at Tech, we run a wood burning engagement programme which is commissioned by four local authorities, Southampton City Council, Winchester City Council, Eastleigh Borough District Council, and New Forest District Council. And we recently made a short animation about the health impacts of wood smoke pollution, which I'd like to share with you now. It's a good introduction to the next section, how to reduce your exposure to air pollution. The Hidden Harms of Wood Smoke. It looks cosy, but do you know how wood burning affects your health and the environment? Wood burning releases a number of harmful gases and tiny invisible particles of black soot and dust called particulate matter. Not all wood smoke is visible, but it pollutes both indoor and outdoor air and is harmful to health. <coughs> 
When we inhale these tiny particles, they enter our bloodstream and can damage our organs. Wood smoke is linked to asthma. Stroke and dementia diabetes and heart disease, cancer and COPD. Wood smoke directly harms the health of your family and community. Reducing and avoiding wood burning is the best thing you can do to breathe cleaner air into your home and neighborhood. Find out more. So, alongside avoiding solid fuel burning where possible, how else can you, your patients, your clients and your family reduce exposure to air pollution? Well, in terms of outdoors, being the most polluted place to be on the road is often inside a vehicle, as the polluted air from the exhaust of the vehicles in front gets sucked into the car and stays trapped there. The occupants consequently breathe high concentrations of pollutants. Indeed, car drivers can be exposed to twice as much air pollution as pedestrians or cyclists. As a consequence, scientists have estimated that commuters using motorised transport lose up to one year in life expectancy in comparison to cyclists. If you have to drive, then it's a good idea to use the recycled air function in your car to try and reduce the amount of external air entering the vehicle. Idling your engine, of course, causes unnecessary pollution which builds up both inside the vehicle and on the street. So the advice is to switch off your engine whenever it's safe to do so. Obviously, every time we drive, we create pollution. So you're helping to improve air quality whenever you leave the car at home, if you have one, that is. When you walk and cycle, the best advice is to do so away from busy roads whenever possible, which cuts exposure to pollution by between 20 to 50 percent. That's particularly important when we exercise, since when we're jogging, for example, we breathe more heavily and don't want to inhale air that is thick with car fumes. Even just travelling along a street one block away from a busy road means you're likely to be breathing cleaner air. And if you do have to walk along a busy road, then stick to the building side of the pavement rather than the roadside curb to reduce your exposure to particulates. There are many apps and websites that offer air quality index forecasts that can be used to help you plan activities and avoid exercising or being outside during periods of high pollution. And that's especially important if you or your patients have a health condition that's exacerbated by poor air quality. When it comes to improving indoor air quality, the best advice is to reduce the source of emissions, keep the home or office or school dry, ventilate it well and protect from outdoor pollution where possible. So in terms of uh, reducing the source of emissions, don't burn solid fuels such as coal and wood if you have an alternative. Gas central heating is far cleaner in terms of air pollution than a log burner. Heat pumps and other low carbon heating methods are cleaner still and lower carbon, of course. Any form of combustion, even candles and incense sticks, will pollute the air, so it's good to avoid using those regularly if you wish to improve indoor air quality. Use fragrance-free cleaning products and avoid using too much of them. And you can choose paints that have a low VOC content. Some products, products are now labeled low volatile organic compounds. Heating and cooking with gas is much cleaner than burning coal or wood, but using gas does release tiny particles of nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide into the air. And cooking itself can generate particulates. So if a gas oven or hob is being used, it's important to ventilate the room by using an extraction fan and or opening windows to stop pollution building up. The same is true when cleaning and, cleaning and bathing, to avoid breathing in cleaning products and to allow excess moisture to escape. And this prevents condensation building up, which could lead to mold growth. Opening trickle vents can help increase ventilation too. 
If patients and clients are worried about pollution levels around their home, they can protect indoor quality to a certain extent by thinking about which windows they open and try to open those that are furthest away from the road and close windows during peak times when outdoor air pollution is likely to be at its worst. Ensure your boiler is well, well maintained so that it burns fuel cleanly, which will reduce the amount of pollution being emitted around the property from the boiler flue and will save money too. It should be serviced regularly by a gas safe engineer and for added peace of mind, you can fit a CO alarm at home, since carbon monoxide, which can leak from faulty boilers, is a poisonous gas with no smell or taste. And if anyone in the household smokes, they can be signposted to an NHS stop smoking service or a pharmacist. Secondhand smoking, which can linger on clothing and furnishing, contains traces of 4,000 chemicals, of which 200 are known poisons, such as formaldehyde. So a large part of our work here at Tech is supporting people to improve the energy efficiency of their property to ensure that they have a warm home. And this is important for indoor air quality since a warm home reduces the risk of damp and mold. We also help clients to upgrade their heating systems where possible. More energy efficient heating systems reduce the demand for energy generation, which in turn reduces air pollution air quality and energy efficiency are two sides of the same coin. So in the last minute, I'll just briefly explain about our affordable warmth projects. We run the Hitting the Cold Spot service on behalf of Hampshire County Council, for Hampshire residents and for Southampton Healthy Home Service on behalf of Southampton City Council for Southampton residents. And these offer information and advice to all residents by free phone, online and some home visits, including keeping and staying warm and well, saving energy and affording your energy bills, switching energy, energy provider or tariff and tackling condensation and mould. And there's also additional practical support depending on eligibility, for example, help for access to grants and funding where available for insulation or boiler repairs temporary electric heaters if someone is without heating, um, help with applying for the warm home discount and priority services register, and referrals and signposting to other organisations for benefits and debt advice or home safety visits. This slide shows our project flyers. If you would like some copies to share or want more information about the project, then please do get in touch. These are our contact details. If your patients, your clients, family or friends need help with energy efficiency, with heating, how to keep warm and well, and advice on fuel poverty issues, then please share our 0800 number, or you can refer them with their permission, of course, by phone or online form. And for further information about clean air issues, please email us at cleanair at environmentcentre.com. And please do visit our website as it has lots of information about all the topics that we're discussing here today. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel, for some really practical tips on what we can do to reduce those sources of air pollution and reduce our exposure to them. Um, and um, for sharing our contact details. So, We've got a feedback survey that's going to come up at the end of the webinar when you close it and there you can request additional information just by sharing your name and contact details and obviously we'll store that in line with GDPR um, and get back to you about um, any of those services if you want to find out more. I've also seen some questions coming in so we're waiting um, a few more minutes for Malcolm to arrive from his other um, webinar so I thought we could start with a few questions before he gets here. Um, I don't know if the other panelists can also see the questions. And so one of the questions is around um, planting street trees or using house plants to help with air pollution. So I don't know, Stephen or Hazel, if you have any comments on that and what the impact of that might be. Yeah, great, great question. And of course, a lot of it in the lay uh, press about um, um, planting, trees and, and house plants. Um, there's no doubt that house plants can reduce pollutants indoor, but their impact is actually quite small. I mean, one has to be absolutely frank about this. I mean, you'd need to fill your house 
uh, almost turn it into a greenhouse to make it, uh, you know, a really impactful uh, intervention. That doesn't mean that house plants aren't useful. Of course they are, and they're great to have around the house anyway. And, and don't forget, they do give out oxygen, which is obviously quite a useful thing to have in your house at the same time. As for tree planting, well, yes, they do. Uh, and certainly a number of schools now are planting hedges and, and so on around their environments. But again, it's only a, a relatively small intervention. I mean, you know, we're talking here about air pollutants, not necessarily just coming from vehicles, but from a wide variety of different sources. And it's the background level of pollution, not necessarily the acute levels that go up quickly uh, in a street canyon, but background levels that we've got to get down. And that's why we need both local and central government to start beginning to help us more in this area. We all have a role to play, as, as Hazel says, and I think if we all work together on this, we can do it. Tree planting has other benefits, and you'll no doubt be uh, very much uh, aware of that with the climate change agenda and the importance of uh, a greening our environment. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Um, and so the other question that we've got is about whether our exposure to air pollutants is likely to be greater inside or outside of the home for a typical householder, um, both in urban or suburban environment. Well, this is your big moment, Hazel. <laughs> I think it depends very much on where you live, where you're living and what's happening if you live by a busy street. I know that in my neighbourhood um, during the summer months, it's fairly quiet and uh, the air seems relatively clean, although I live in Winchester, so I, I know it's not. But in the winter, I know with the wood smoke that the pollution levels um, are very are very high, particulate matter in particular. So I think there are a great deal of variables. So it's a difficult question to answer, I'm afraid. And, and of course, there are no such thing as indoor air because all indoor air comes from outside. Uh, in reality, um, what we do indoors, as Hazel so carefully explained, is we add additional chemicals to those that are outside. So we use sprays and, and all sorts of other chemicals. So that's why, in a way, we are rather concerned about it. Um, you know, we are trying to get more information about the health effects of, of these chemicals used indoors. They're poorly regulated at the moment. The house design and building industry uh, kind of has slipped under the radar really in this whole area. And there are responsibilities, of course, to make sure, as we saw during COVID-19, the importance of ventilating our indoor spaces. But the last thing you want to do is to ventilate them with exhaust fumes coming from outside your, your house. So I think one has to be uh, sensible here. And if you are living close to a main road and you want to ventilate your home, which is a very good thing to do, then obviously opening the windows at the back of the house is probably good. Or even opening them at times when there isn't a lot of traffic around, because then that diminishes the ingression of uh, vehicle related pollutants. Brilliant. Thank you, both of you. Um, just related to what you were saying, Stephen, about that um, the cleaning products and things being regulated and labelled appropriately, we've got a question about um, sort of whose responsibility that might be and, and how they could be labelled appropriately for um, indoor air pollution. Um, yeah, well, this is where we need to get tighter regulation, to be honest. Uh, and as, as Hazel correctly pointed out, I mean, we've probably underestimated the health impacts of indoor air, poor indoor air quality. And therefore it is important, A, we get more information about what the air is like in our homes, in different homes, in different parts of the United Kingdom. And in our UKRI research program, uh, which the government has spent 22 and a half million pounds on in the last three years, there's a lot of new science being done to try and understand more about the indoor air space. So watch, watch this area, we are going to find new information. And I think when we realize what's in the air we're breathing indoors, uh, we're going to obviously going to want to talk to the um, you know, construction industry, the builders, but more importantly, to the government about regulation and labeling of products to make sure that our young children and others are not exposed to increased chemicals beyond those that we're currently exposed to by breathing the outdoor air anyway. 
Uh, so there's a lot of work to do here, but it's an exciting area of science and one where my community in respiratory health and, and environmental measures uh, are quite um, engaged at the present time. Brilliant. Um, that we've had a question about EVs. And so as Hazel pointed out in her presentation that they can also generate particular emissions um, by extra weight and by the tire and brake wear um, that is that affected both EVs and internal combustion engine um, cars. And so someone is asking whether sort of talking about EVs as um, a um, route out of air pollution is a bit of a distraction from general traffic reduction. Well, whoever that wonderful person is, they've got the right message. I mean, we've got to get the cars off the road. We've got to improve our public transport. We've got to promote active travel. And, uh, you know, organisations like your own, Christabel, connected with local authorities, have a big uh, role to play in this, to, to get local authorities to put the infrastructure in, to get our cars off the road. I mean, when you think about it, you know, over half the journeys we make every day are less than one mile. I mean, do we really need to get into a car to do that? I mean, I would argue that, yes, occasionally we do to get the shopping in or whatever, but most of it, like going to school or maybe um, going to see friends, you know, we could use active travel, uh, but we need a safe infrastructure to do that. And, uh, and our local authorities and our central government obviously are important in helping promote that. The other thing about this, though, uh, is technology, you know, uh, Technology does have some fixes. Yes, electric vehicles, you know, they are one step further down the cleaning process. But as you pointed out, you know, the brake and, and tire wear uh, are, are issues. But industry is working hard now to change the, the uh, composition of tires and to use induction braking in electric vehicles, which uh, doesn't use friction to generate particles to help reduce the particles. And there's even, uh, you know, car manufacturers are fitting to their vehicles now particle traps uh, in the real whims to capture particles that are coming off tires. So technical fixes have a role as well as, of course, trying to get the vehicles off the road in the first place. Yeah, definitely. And it looks like we're being joined by Malcolm. And I'll give you a few minutes to catch your breath after the last webinar, Malcolm. But um, we're just answering some questions um, and we're ready to go when you are. So I just a uh, final question before we move on to Malcolm, and it was related, I think, to something you said, Stephen, um, was about sort of the context and the difference between background pollution levels and local pollution. So I don't know if there's a, more you can say on that. A, a wonderful question, uh, whoever uh, framed it. I mean, I think the important thing here is that we're all quite familiar with air pollution episodes, acute rises in pollution during the winter or during the summer months. Um, but we're less familiar with this background level, and it's the background level which is probably driving a lot of this chronic disease we've all been talking about. And I think this is really where we've got to get more action. The problem with it, as again, Hazel, uh, uh, you intimated in your introduction, um, was that out of sight, out of mind. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. But the problem is it does exist. So we've got to work now across multiple stakeholders to get the background level of air pollution down. And that's why those World Health Organization limit values, which I put up on that table, uh, reducing those by a quarter um, over the next 20 years is really, really important. And that's going to involve changes in lifestyle for us all. Uh, whether we like it or not, we're going to have to uh, change the way we live. Uh, to accommodate that. But it'll be a cleaner environment. And in the end, it'll be a nicer environment to live in than our rather dirty post-industrial environment that we're currently living in now. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so I've seen a few more questions coming in and we'll save them for the Q&A after Malcolm is finished. But if I can now introduce um, Malcolm. Our third and final speaker today is Dr. Malcolm White, who's a medical doctor and clean air specialist working with Global Action Plan, which is the clean air charity and organizer of Clean Air Day today. Um, he's been working on two projects with Global Action Plan, teaching health professionals in primary care about the dangers of air pollution, as well as how to pass on this learning to patients. 
and um, so really topical um, for the talk today. He'll summarise his teaching, then reflect on the successes and challenges participants have noted in their feedback. And Malcolm, hopefully you should be able to share your slides. Yep, I'll jump on with that. Thanks very much, uh, Christabel. Right, so I've got my slides here, which I'm going to share, and then go to the slideshow elements. Mm -hmm. So it always takes a little second for it to work on Zoom. So sorry, just while that's loading up anyway, as I got that very kind introduction, my name is uh, Dr. Malcolm White. <clears throat> I've uh, been mostly a hospital doctor in my career for about 10 years. And then in the last year, I've sort of sidestepped into um, working with Global Action Plan because I wanted to do some work which was more environmentally focused. And that that's essentially why I've been doing this. Um, so, as again was uh, suggested in that introduction, we've been doing a couple of projects which have been looking at air pollution, speaking to primary care practitioners in this in this project, and speaking to them about how they can speak to their patients about air pollution, which is you know so important. And I just have to apologise for not being able to join sooner, but I was running my own webinar which I just finished in Scotland, so it's been a busy day for all of us. Um, so yeah, this uh, map that I put together was essentially just um, 40 odd GPs across all of England who were participating. So it really provided a really wide geographical spread as well as quite a wide demographic spread in terms of the patient populations which were being represented by their GPs. Um, I'm imagining that Sir Stephen Holgate um, would have used this slide earlier because I think it's one quite commonly found and also one that uh, he's previously used in um, lecture series that he did with Global Action Plan. But um, it's really now that we've heard about the pathology, how it impacts the body, and we've heard um, you know, about a number of the sources, we can now think about how this relates to actually the patient groups that we speak to on the front line. Who, who are the people that we... Um, you know, want to bring this health information to. And, you know, we, we've certainly heard about the respiratory and cardiovascular disease, including stroke. Um, but it is also worth mentioning the impact on a child's development, including decreased lung function and growth, as well as their neurological impacts as well. So it's large studies will show that learning is poorer in areas um, where there's high levels of air pollution. There are the metabolic diseases, and as well as significant impacts on skin, as well as pregnancy and fertility as well. So really a wide range of people that we can speak to. And I boil this down into a number of patient groups that we can speak to. Now, this is by all means non-exhaustive, it's worth saying, but we can definitely consider the respiratory conditions for, ch uh, for child and adult. We can really consider giving this information in um, in our consultations to all children. It really is that broad a category um, because it really impacts on their development. So it's very significant. And then we have a number of other conditions, but including um, all of the checks that people get for pregnancy and fertility as well. It's also worth mentioning the impact on mental health. Now that's not to say that air pollution is the causative factor of anxiety and depression in the UK, but it can be a contributing factor as well. And some of the solutions that are often helpful in people with anxiety and depression, such as walking in green spaces, are also very helpful for um, you know, mental health as well. Um, and their lower levels of air pollution as well. So we have this patient group and we're wanting to talk to them about air pollution. It's definitely worth us considering that if we want to get this message across in a way that's going to land with people and that might inspire behavior change, that we want to reinforce the message several times in different ways in order to be the most effective. And for the example of primary care, which very neatly applies to secondary care as well, we can think about um, patients that might have they might come into the practice or into the waiting room of the clinic and then they see some posters on the wall which talk about air pollution and some of the things that they can do uh, to tackle it or to prevent their exposure. They'll have a consultation with the health professional who might give them some advice 
And then lastly, there might be a number of leaflets um, or say texts which are prepared, which can be sent out to the patient afterwards or handed to them as they leave the appointment. So just to dive into that a little bit more deeply for a minute, um, again, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but we can really consider a number of the pre-consultation opportunities um, that can yeah, be provided to um, our patients. And it's definitely worth noting the difference between consultations which happen in person versus electronic these days, um, much more common as well than it used to be in, after the times of COVID. Um, but uh, many practices, oh, sorry, many practices or um, clinics will have websites or social media pages. Um, often when people phone up for an appointment, there'll be a queue system. So there could be messaging delivered there and say they're coming in for prescriptions. And if uh, I've already mentioned the waiting rooms, which could include, say, electronic notice boards. And if you have a patient coming newly to an area, say for a GP surgery, um, then you can actually inform them as part of the process what the air pollution is like in their area. So that would be a really interesting and useful way to give them that information. So all things before the, before the consultation happens. During the consultation, and this is certainly the bread and butter for many people in terms of um, you know, why we're in medicine, when we can give this information across, and when we can potentially have the most impact is when we're you know, speaking face-to-face -face or electronically face-to-face -face with our patients. So ideally, we would want to integrate elements of this advice into our history. And um, so the patient classically might present to you and say, I'm breathless, doctor. Um, now, ear pollution isn't the only concern, of course, at that time. You're going to be wanting to do plenty of investigations and really dive down into the history to understand what is causing this condition. But at the same time, you might be able to say to them, we're going to be investigating this. We want to look into it. Maybe during this time, could you... One thing that you can consider is when you're walking down to the shops, perhaps going down the side streets, because that will be impacting on your health because of air pollution. Um, and you can reduce your exposure by going through green parks or down side streets. So just as specific bits of advice that we can give. Speaking of that, in the management plan, you know, the bits of advice which are followed most effectively would be specific achievable goals. And I'll be demonstrating that through a number of leaflets that we um, have produced at Global Action Plan, and I'll run through them br briefly as well. When we're giving lifestyle advice to patients, which is generally to improve their health, of course, it might be to improve their metabolic profile or to improve their weight um, because of the impacts that it's having on their health. Um, we might offer to socially prescribe them to a walking group, or we might be just advising them to join um, running clubs or walking groups or anything like that, or even just walk themselves. And in all of those cases, you could really link up and say the co cool benefit of having more like better air quality is by going through green spaces and not running down the main streets in order to get more miles in, so to speak. Fine, and then closing statements. Um, you know, th this can be an opportunity to perhaps give a leaflet or to actually signpost the patients towards another resource, such as a website. Um, and we have a uh, global action plan, we have the Clean Air Hub, which I'll speak about a bit more in a minute. Once the consultation is complete, um, there are still further opportunities um, in order to give across some of this messaging to your patients. And I've sort of mentioned link workers or social prescribing. So you might have a walking group which is associated with your practice. Now you could speak to the leader of that walking group, make sure that they're familiar with the concepts of air pollution and how to avoid it by taking their groups through parks and everything like that. Um, or you could give them leaflets to hand out. So, you know, onboarding everyone into your clean air team, so to speak. If you've got pharmacies which are associated with your practice or in your hospital clinic or anything like that, then certainly having posters in those areas as well and speaking to your pharmacists to actually, again, onboard them, get them part of your team so that you can have that um, collaborative approach to delivering this important healthcare messaging. And then lastly, um, I mentioned signposting already, but we have um, electronic versions of a number of leaflets which are free to use and download and everything like that from the 
from the Global Action Plan website, and they could be um, you know, sent to the patient electronically or they could be physically handed a leaflet um, in order to give them further information after this appointment as well. So just a few specialist consultations, which I think are specifically worth mentioning as opportunities to give um, ear pollution messaging. They might be um, appointments where you have a little bit more time with a patient, or they might be, say, nurse-led in the community, such as an annual asthma review um, or a diabetes review. Sometimes you have a, a little bit more time to give health and lifestyle advice during those appointments. There's also the fairly common uh, COPD reviews for a patient just quickly out of hospital and you want to make sure that they stay out of hospital and keep them well um, and then of course all of the midwife and pregnancy checks which happen during a pregnancy or the eight week baby checks and all of the um, postnatal checks which go on they're all opportunities to sort of talk about improving um, air quality in the home or avoiding air pollution um, outside and then a couple of what I would call opportunistic ones is people coming in with say immunizations or for some blood taking phlebotomy then you might not be having much of a conversation with those people about their wider health concerns but you can probably speak to them about air pollution for 10 seconds or so so definitely all good opportunities um, for how we can bring air pollution messaging to our patients so i'll just go through um, a number of leaflets that we have and i won't dwell on them for too long but I think that they link up quite well with what you've been hearing earlier in this talk in terms of some of the actual active things that patients can do to avoid air pollution and to reduce their contributions. These are all two-sided A5 leaflets um, which you could print larger I suppose if you wanted but that, that's the, the aim of size that they're targeted as. And um, this one is adult focused and it talks about a lot of the health impacts of air pollution it does reassure people that there are some things that they can do to help and it directs them towards Clean Air Hub, which, as I said, is a patient focused um, section of the Global Action Plan website where they can get information about air pollution that you might not have time to give them all. And then on the second side, it talks about the things that people can do to have an impact on the air that you and your family breathe. And so that's split into outdoor or ambient air pollution. And then on the second half here, it talks about things that people can do indoors. You might have some patients who understandably aren't able to engage that much in outdoor air pollution stuff. And that's kind of in, in terms of bringing them along and a no blame culture, you'd be able to empathize with them when they say, my school that I take my kids to is four miles from my house and I don't have time to do that in the morning with anything other than a car. Then you're like, you know, there are some things you can do, but maybe not right now. Um, but there are other things that they could do, like parking the car further away from the school and walking the last distance. So you don't have that really, really high buildup of air pollutants right outside the school. One thing to consider. Um, and a number of things that this same person would be able to do are things around the home. So particularly things like reducing their use of scented cleaning products or strong cleaning products, avoiding plug-in fragrances. And then if they're decorating at home using products that which don't have VOC compounds in them, um, asking people not to smoke is an obvious one as well, but then reducing home burning as much as possible. Um, and lastly, although very importantly, ventilating as much as possible if you're like cooking or cleaning and maybe even closing your windows if you live right beside a main road. So the second type of leaflet here, very similar, so I won't go through in nearly as much detail, but it's more child focused and it talks about their development as much as it does about some of the conditions which can be caused or worsened by air pollution. The second type of leaflet that we have is um, a checklist type um, leaflet. And I think that that aligns somewhat with the um, personalized asthma plan that many patients and children often will go through. It gives them a sense of ownership of the condition and perhaps a sense of control that they're actually engaging with their health condition in order to control it better. Um, so this one it has many of the same um, ideas in terms of things that people can do, but then it also has that tick box element on the other side so that people can feel like they're gaining that sense of power and control. So this one is somewhat asthma focused and it's more pediatric. And then the other one is more general in terms of a number of 
adult health conditions. Um, and then it has, again, very similar tick box structure on the other side. So I mentioned the Clean Air Hub, just to sort of highlight it there. And there's, there's um, the address for you to consider directing your patients towards. It was um, DEFRA funded as well, so government funded. And I think they actually would recommend people go to this website rather than like a branch of the DEFRA website. So it's a, it's a good resource for patients. It has a number of areas, including background information in terms of what your pollution is and how it impacts your health. It has, um, you know, it, it tells patients some of the things that they can do to reduce their contributions and exposures. And they can also look at a calculator um, to think about how much air, produce, air pollution that they produce themselves. Another section of the website that I think is particularly useful is called the Clean Air Knowledge Hub. Um, but the address is up there at the top as well. And this, this website, I think we might rejig the imagery on it sometime soon, but the actual content is really quite excellent. It has a number of training videos, including uh, the lecture from Sir Stephen Holgate that he did with GAP, uh, another from Professor Jonathan Grigg, and then actually one that myself and a colleague recorded recently based off of the teaching that we were delivering for our primary healthcare um, colleagues. It also has many types of leaflets and posters and other things like that, which are all free to download and you can print them out in order to hang them up in your clinic or hand them out to your patients. One website, I think it's quite useful to highlight because I'm one piece of feedback that I was having from our GPs in terms of something that's quite useful and quite quick to do with a patient is like, give me your postcode, ding, 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 put it in, and it tells you what the level of air pollution is as, as quickly as they, um, as most recent as possible. It's, you know, it's very up to date um, as a website. It's very simple, and I like, I like the, the premise of it because it's an easy way to engage with your patients. And when I did it myself yesterday, it showed moderate, and I think that's probably because of the reasonably high levels, um, the high pressure at the moment. And I live in Glasgow myself, and um, the air pollution levels are relatively bad for the UK, um, but Scotland in general, the air pollution levels are not super high. So it really is a sort of a focal point in that regard. Um, but yeah. So what I would sort of consider my top line messages for patients in ter terms of what we would hope that you're able to deliver to them is that air pollution seriously impacts your health. And it's not just the health of vulnerable people or people with pre-existing health conditions or just children or anything. It really does impact across uh, the lifespan from birth to death and even before birth because of um, the impact on pregnancy. But also, um, yeah, a lot of people will just say air pollution doesn't bother me, you know, it has, it has no impact. But um, as it has been in intimated already, it really um, increases your risk long term of having a number of health conditions. There are things that the individual can do to reduce their amount of air pollution contributions. But there are also things, importantly, that uh, the individual and the patients can do to reduce their exposure to air pollution. So last couple of slides from me. Um, now, what I, we, we've been calling this um, our clean air champions in terms of these GP colleagues. And we've actually had this with previous projects involving pediatricians um, and involving respiratory colleagues as well. And in this, um, you know, we gave them lots of materials, we gave them some teaching, and we asked them to start speaking to patients. We, you know, it's really important to get it into your, get it into your habits in terms of what you can speak to the patients. And so you develop habits, you develop a ways that work for you in terms of bringing it across to your patients and it becomes part of your routine. And beyond that, we've asked our GP colleagues and other primary healthcare practitioners um, to introduce it to their consultations, but then actually share it amongst their practice colleagues, which can obviously work in other settings such as secondary care as well. People were then speaking at education meetings, which has definitely been happening. And then um, some people have been keen enough to potentially step up and speak at regional meetings as well. And other ways in which people can, you know, healthcare practitioners can um, make a really big impact is by speaking to local and national representatives. It's a really, really strong voice when it comes from healthcare professionals. And so I can only encourage you to do that as well. 
And then lastly, particularly pertinent for England and Wales, I believe, um, it's worth talking about there is a consultation out just now by the UK government or by DEFRA, um, which is looking at the environmental targets, particularly those around particulate matter 2.5 and how ambitious the UK government should be in terms of when we should aim to get to what level by. And this closes pretty much at the end of the month and it will take you maybe about 20 minutes to do or something like that, but it's very much worthwhile. Um, I think this has probably been talked about already, but the WHO levels target for 2.5 is five micrograms per meters, cubic meter. Um, and then the UK government is aiming to have that, have the level of 10 by 2040. And I think that um, most healthcare and clean air related charities and everything like that are not happy it that is not quick enough and we really need to aim for more ambitious targets much quicker than that for example um there's a collection of health charities who are aiming for us to potentially reach that by 2030 a level of 10 but at the same time if you want to say be as ambitious as possible as quickly as possible then um, that is a really great voice as well to having healthcare pr professionals involved in this consultation is an extremely powerful thing Okay, so I think that is me. Um, so I'll stop sharing and I'm very happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I think we're opening into wider discussion. Brilliant, thank you so much, Malcolm, for those sort of opportunities and methods for sharing the clean air message with patients and members of the public and how we can all be better clean air champions uh, with the people that we advise or provide information to. Um, so that's the end of the presentations now um, and we're moving on to the Q&A. Um, I've been looking at the Q&A chat and um, we'll be going through as many of those questions as we can get through. Um, and also I just wanted to share with the speakers that we've had lots of thanks in the chat. Someone particularly likes your cheese plant, Malcolm, but um, <laughs> we've had, uh, yeah, it's definitely um, people are really appreciative of all the information um, and ideas. So um, if I just move over to the Q&As, um, some of these link back to the previous presentations as well. So um, one is talking about the clear links between climate change um, and action for clean air, um, and whether there's any sort of messaging that could cover both of those, and is air pollution a way to engage people on climate change more widely? So I don't know if any of you um, three speakers want to, to pick up on that. Stephen. Absolutely. And um, we haven't done enough of this, really. <clears throat> when you think about it, the targets for climate change uh, have already been agreed at COP26. And some of the uh, um, activities for achieving uh, net zero, as it's called, uh, are already being rolled out across the UK. And what's important here is that industry, as well as the broader community, you know, are engaging with this. Uh, but what hasn't happened uh, is its connection with improving air quality at the same time. And the reasons for that is rather strange because it looks as if the climate change community and all the science behind all of that has come out of one area whereas the um, air pollution stuff is in another compartment. But they're beginning to connect. And there are four air pollutants in particular that uh, contribute to climate change, many orders of magnitude greater than carbon dioxide. And uh, the ones in particular are carbon dioxide, NO2, uh, the secondary formation of ozone, which we're getting in this hot weather, and as Hazel mentioned, uh, the vol volatile organic chemicals, including methane, which of course comes out of agriculture um, as well. And I, I think the messaging for climate change, although it's sometimes given as rather negative, actually, generally speaking, it's being put over as a positive thing now. I think the public really do understand the positive gains by greening our environment and, and making life more pleasant for people, as well as getting CO2 down. Uh, but the, the air pollution messaging uh, is not as positive. And I, I've talked to Global Action Plan and Larissa Lockwood about this. I think what we really do need is to improve the messaging 
around air pollution, which creates positive messages as opposed to all the things that people think about right now, which are the financial problems or the travel problems or whatever it is. And there are lots of good positive messages. So maybe uh, we need to do more work to connect these two communities. And uh, just before I came on this call uh, today, uh, I was in touch with Joe Churchill and the permanent secretary in DEFRA um, who looks after this area and said, look, this is the time we need to connect these two far more effectively. And of course, it aligns perfectly with Global Action Plan because that's exactly what they do. They are involved in climate change and, and, and uh, post-consumerism, as well as uh, the interesting work on cleaning up the air. So there you are, Malcolm. <laughs> You've got a great advert there. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I probably would have just said similar things, to be honest. And um, in, ter in terms of when I joined the organization, um, I essentially asked this question and the, the 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 question from the audience and it was the the answer essentially is that air, a lot of um the activities that you do towards air pollution will also tack it, tackle things to do with climate change and in terms of when global action plan was thinking about which areas to target initially this was a number of years ago then air pollution is one of the things which is impacting people now and in their health but it is also has co benefits in terms of like the climate sustainability so it really is win-win in that regard yeah 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 anyway watch the space <laughs> perfect thank you both um I, i've noticed a few uh, questions or comments around um you know sharing messages around bonfires um and also about um the air pollution being greater inside the car so uh, there's been that's kind of been answered in the chat but just for everyone's benefit so the wood burning project that we are and the messages that we're sharing cover both in indoor um, burning uh, in a, a wood fire, but also um, outdoor burning in bonfires and, and other means. So um, we have that messaging and we're happy to share that if people want to take some of those away. Um, and then Hazel also mentioned that Mums for Lungs have lots of great information about how to share messaging around um, the pollution being worse inside the car um, for people who might, might want to find out more about that. Um, so just to go back to the questions, um, someone um, asks about the sort of legal consequences of not meeting um, air pollution um, levels and particularly if we were to move in the UK towards the World Health Organization levels rather than the hangover EU levels that are higher. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that, might be a bit outside. Go well, I just have a quick thought on it. Um, is that there are certainly organizations who are more than happy to take governments to account um, in terms of like take them to le legally take them to account, take them to court um, if they make targets and then they don't meet them. So in some senses, that's why maybe the government is not like super keen on doing the most ambitious targets because they want to have things that they can achieve. But at the same time, things that Global Action Plan and other charities are approaching the government with is actually a plan of this is how you could do this rather than actually just saying to them, you know, we want you to do this. Um, so having, having an actual plan in place, I think, helps that along as well. Um, so, yeah, I just hope that we can get for a more ambitious target. Yeah, I do too. And we all do. Um, I think one of the things that came up in the Environment Bill and this consultation, which you kindly mentioned, um, is the, the second level, which is to reduce exposure of the population, really, um, and to set targets around exposure uh, um, reduction. Uh, and I think government's quite keen on this, which is great. Um, and I think the other thing about exposure reduction, of course, is that it's not just around, you know, one particular pollutant. It's, it's around all of the pollutants, which Hazel and... Malcolm talked about. So, you know, it's about doing things in a different way, basically, so that the mixture of chemicals pumped out there into the air uh, is, is reduced. And, uh, you know, I'm particularly keen on, on the uh, reduction of exposure side. And at the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution in 2007, we first came up with this as an idea, but look, where are we now? 2022, and we're only just beginning to talk about it. So uh, 
exposure reduction is critical, I think. And narrowing the gap, you know, you mentioned five Malcolm micrograms per meter cube for, for PM2.5, which is great. But I mean, you know, we just need to keep going down and down and down. And I think once the sort of, uh, once the ball really starts to move seriously in this area, and we all hope it will, then this relentless reduction needs to continue. And we all need to sort of uh, push it as far as we can, because as I said in my talk, which you missed, um, is that there is no safe level of air pollution. Brilliant. Um, so we've got a couple of questions related now to sort of health environments, um, healthcare professionals. Um, someone asks, uh, would the speakers recommend monitoring air quality inside and outside of a hospital um, to address pollution um, and whether that could include shutting windows um, on, and that sort of thing to reduce the impact on people inside the hospital? Maybe just quickly, i jump on that. And I think um, it's worth looking at your council in terms of what they actually measure already, because I was at my other webinar, they were speaking about some level of um, monitoring which goes on outside the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, which is the big one in, in the Glasgow area, the sort of flagship. And um, so there might be some monitoring which already happens. Um, but at the same time, I think, yes, it is great. You know, the, the more monitoring that we have and the more accurate that it is, um, actually gives us a better picture because a lot of the monitoring that happens is sort of they put these tubes in a machine which gives you an average over a month which is like sure that's quite useful it gives us our annual averages and that's where we get the figures like 10 micrograms per person per annum you know per meter cube sorry um but actually what i think i would love to see is more of the use of like live monitoring which is unfortunately more expensive but it means that outside of school, when you've got the school run, you'll see these relatively high spikes of air pollution, which then just gradually uh, diffuse into the atmosphere around as well. So I think, yes, it, it would be great to have more monitoring. Yeah. And I think there's quite a strong push to do this now. This They call it hyper-local air pollution monitoring, having portable, um, affordable air pollution monitors uh, scattered through communities so that they know what they're exposed to outside of GP surgery or a school or a hospital. Um, that's definitely going to happen. And I think once that really does happen and the public really do get to see exactly what the levels of pollutants are in their locality, that's going to be very catalytic in promoting change because no local authority will want to be able to see that they're the worst in terms of <laughs> what their hospital patients with all these diseases we've been talking about uh, are exposed to. And then yesterday at the NHS um, National Health Service Federation meeting in Liverpool, um, you know, they were talking a lot uh, about ambulances sitting outside hospitals with their engines running. You know, I mean, this clearly is something that needs to be taken on board now that we can't have our hospitals uh, being some of the worst offenders in many ways of the pollution because of how they've used to run um, and, and you know changes got to happen even though it is going to cost money but you know that's what this is all about we're going to have to make commitments to alter the way we do things and electric vehicles are going to be the way i think uh, for, for greening up to some extent the ambulance fleet, but also car parking around hospitals. You know, uh, I mean, there's been a dramatic change with COVID of, 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 you know, having consultations remotely and not necessarily having to drive to a hospital to see somebody. And, and it's the intelligent use of all of this alternative approach, which I think needs to be taken account of. And maybe uh, in our different uh, countries, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, we can think of different ways of, of, you know, introducing these new ways of working so that air pollution around our health centres uh, is, is reduced. Yeah. Yeah, we, I know that sort of traffic around the General Hospital in Southampton has definitely has been an issue in the past. Um, one question which I think probably directly goes to Malcolm, if you're happy to answer it, is around how can healthcare professionals get involved in this and how can people get more healthcare professionals involved in it for those you know who aren't here today, who aren't necessarily aware of the issue, um, maybe it's not on their radar or don't consider it as serious. So I don't know if yeah. you have any. 
Brilliant. Um, so what I actually forgot to mention is that we have slides um, on our website as well, this Clean Air Knowledge Hub. So if you just search for that, then you'll find the training materials, including those of uh, Stephen, and then um, training videos, which have been lent there, lots of resources, and actually sort of, you could take the slides, make them slightly your own, um, and then present them yourself, you know, to, to your colleagues. So it's, it's definitely possible to get this out there um, to our colleagues who aren't able to attend today. Um, otherwise, I would say in terms of the speaking to the patients, it just takes getting started, as in you just kind of need to take those early steps, start having those small conversations, consider the patient groups where it's most relevant to start with. Um, you know, obviously, in a busy clinic, you're going to have about five seconds sometimes to deliver some of this information, or you might have two minutes, or you might have zero time, but you can hand them a leaflet as they go out the door and say, this is to do with air pollution, I think it's relevant to your condition, I'm sorry that we don't have more time today. You know, um, so it can really be as quick as that, or it can be that you take a bit more time if you have it available. Brilliant. And just leading on from that, um, we obviously have some attendees from local government um, here today, and um, someone's asked about, um, from their experience, that some of the um, improvements in air quality at a local government level can be restricted by national policies and objectives and resource, um, particularly where they're, they're working in an area where it doesn't technically exceed the air quality objectives, although obviously we know that there are no safe levels, and asking for advice um, if anyone on the panel has ideas for local government officers to drive the air quality messaging um, and actions forward with those sort of national restrictions. Um, I mean, a quick, a quick thought would be in any of those conversations, recognizing that the monitoring is not effective enough. Um, as in, if, the, if you're speaking to someone and they're like, well, our levels are fine. And you're like, well, actually, we don't monitor it well enough to really, truly understand it. Especially someone made the point that they've only got like one centralized thing for this massive area that they live in then you just don't have a good enough idea. But we do know that like trunk roads, busy streets, all of these things will have levels of air pollution which are harmful to human health. No doubt about it. Yeah. It's, difficult to it's difficult to argue against that. But I do appreciate that people are often thinking numerically in, in these areas. Yeah, and one of the points that someone's made in the chat is about creating a dialogue between doctors um, who are experiencing it and their patients are experiencing it and between the people in local authority, whether it's public health or um, people involved in travel and transport, um, about that kind of working together, cutting pollution, sharing information. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, something else that there's a potentially good link there between local government and um, local health services. Um, so we just have one um, final question, we're almost at the end of time, um, about the um, air pollution, um, address pollution site that you shared, um, Malcolm, um, and so wondering where sort of the data for that has come from um, and how um, it's kind of being, you know, broken down to sort of that postcode level. I don't know if you know more about it or whether there's a good place to direct people. Yeah, I'll be honest, it was highlighted to me quite recently um, and I've not had enough time to really dig into it. I imagine it comes from model data, but uh, so Stephen, it looks like you have an idea there. Yeah, well, that's right. Uh, there's a, a, a website. I, I haven't got it immediately to be able to put onto the uh, chat. Um, it's run by a guy called Humphrey, uh, who did the work with Imperial College and the Environmental Research Group there, where they've um, got now urban street level air pollution concentrations and are able to even by by your address work out what the exposures are in uh, relatively real time so this is a major advance the difficulty has always been that the modeling to create this has not been um, granular enough but it is now and uh, and it's if you go into the web and put humphrey i don't think you'll find it humphrey and uh, um, postal code uh, air pollution you'll find the website and you can go into that website and you'll be able to see where your own address is and work it all out 
Brilliant, thank you. So we're now at the end of time. So I'm at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to bring it to a close. Um, thank you so much uh, to Professor Holgate and Dr. Malcolm White and Hazel for your presentations. And thank you to everyone for your attending and your questions and um, all of your chat. Um, you know, we really appreciate you attending and all your participation. As I mentioned, there's a short survey when you leave this webinar. So when it ends or you leave it, the a survey will pop up on your browser and you can provide any feedback you want on the uh, webinar and let us know if you want any of those resources or further information that have been uh, mentioned. So that's, yeah, please do pop in your name and email address if you want anything more and we'll um, get back to you about it um, and see if we can answer any of the questions that we weren't able to answer today. Um, so just seeing the chat, there's lots of um, thank yous um, coming through. So I want to pass that on um, to everyone. So yeah, thank you everyone for attending and thank you to our excellent speakers. Well, thank you to you for putting thank it all on. <laughs> it's been very enjoyable. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Really great. Yeah, thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of Clean Air Day. Yeah, thank you very much, Hazel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.